Good evening, church, and welcome to our midweek service. I hope you are all doing well. As you know, this is our third session with our dear brother Mark Templar. And we are grateful for his faith, wisdom, and his example in humility, in all that he is sharing with, with us from his book and his personal life. The past two session has been powerful and easy to understand. So we are looking forward for today's lesson. Thanks, Mark, for your love for the Dubai Church and the region. Before we pass the mic to Mark, let's pray. God, we are thankful that you are our, our provider and that you have allowed us another chance of learning your knowledge. I, I ask you to bless everyone here tonight and open our hearts and mind and speak through Mike tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Over to you, Mark. Amen. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. I hope you can hear me. Great to see everybody here tonight, and it's a great opportunity to be able to be with you. So um, uh, I, I'm excited to be able to share the word, and thank you for your kind words. Um, let's get right into it if we can. Tonight, we're going to be looking at another uh, passage, and I appreciate all of your eagerness and your willingness to take the evening to, to, to really dig into the scriptures. And so, you know, we've been looking at Jesus' sayings as he hung on the cross or getting near to the cross. Um, last week, we, we looked at uh, um, uh, several sayings um, uh, and it, it really the last couple of weeks. Uh, and so, you know, we looked at Jesus saying, this is my blood of the covenant, covenant um, which is poured out for many. While hanging on the cross, one of his seven sayings was, why have you forsaken me? Jesus, in, in Luke 23, as he was facing the cross, said, don't cry for me. We talked about self-pity and how Jesus didn't fall into self-pity. Um, in Luke 23, 34, again, one of the seven sayings on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. And then as he died on the cross, he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. So we've looked at three, actually, of the seven sayings on the cross as well as with as well as several other things that he said kind of right before and after the cross tonight we're going to look at the other four sayings that Jesus did on the cross and um we're going to talk about loving others and we already uh, you know we know what love is from our own experience right we've all had uh, parents who loved us friends who've loved us many of us are married and we we have spouses uh, or or our children we've experienced love in the church so we know something about love, don't we? And w w you, you know about love because you felt it, okay? But one of the great things of the scriptures is that Jesus gives us a great story about what love is as he dies on the cross. And this reminds us of things we already know through our own experience. So the first point is that love is in the details. In John 19, verse 25 to 27, the Bible says that, Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, dear woman, this is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Very simple passage. As Jesus is dying on the cross, his mom is there, his aunt, Mary, the mother of Clopas, Mary Magdalene is there, who he drove seven demons out of, and John. He's only got four people with him, two of whom are his mom and her sister. And then there's only two disciples who, who managed to have the courage to, to stand near the cross knowing that that could get them into big trouble. 
But love is in the details. Jesus cared about details. You know, Jesus cared about big things. Okay? Jesus cared about the big things. For example, when you have Lazarus who died and Mary and Martha were so upset, Jesus cared about that big event in their life. And we all have big things that happen in our lives, right? I mean, think about the big things that have happened to you. Maybe maybe it was a tough thing, okay? Like my boss's mother died this weekend. That's a big thing. That's huge. And the people who love my boss will feel for him at this difficult moment when his mom died. That's a big deal to have your mom die. It's a big deal when someone's in hospital. It's a big deal when someone graduates from high school or college. It's a big deal when someone gets a job or loses a job. Jesus cared about the things that were big in people's lives. And you know that the people who really love you care about the big things in your life. And one of the ways you know if someone's your friend, when you look back at your life, is you think about the toughest times in your life or the greatest highs, and you think about who was there to share that with you, who realized that that was important to you. And you know, those are your real friends, right? I mean, I, I remember, you know, so when, when I lost my job in London, and I remember the people who were kind and compassionate to me and who encouraged me. And that was a big deal. It was a tough time. But, but I remember that. And you remember that too. And that's part of love is that we need to be paying enough attention that when something big happens to someone else, we get it. And we drop what we're doing and we're there for them. Jesus was there for people when they were dealing with the big things in their lives. That's why you see so many healings and so many special moments. But Jesus also cared about little things. Not just about little children, but little things that really matter to people, even though they're small. You remember the wedding and, you know, the, the, he turned water into wine. That's in one sense, a wedding's a big deal. Absolutely. But running out of wine at a wedding, is not the biggest thing in the world, right? It's a, it's a small little detail. And yet love is all about the little details. A mother cares for their little child and the the thing we remember as we grow up is how our mother took care of our little needs, right? And I, I mean, I love Nadine is so attentive with our children and makes every moment special. And, and you know, moms do that, that tender kind of special concern about little things that, that touches our heart, that, that they pay attention to the little things. The Bible says God knows the number of hairs on our head. God cares about the little things in our lives. So does Jesus Christ. He cared even about when a sparrow fell to the ground. When people were hungry, Jesus made sure they were fed. You know, even on the cross, we see Jesus caring about big things and little things. You know, we see him thinking of others. We see him telling his, his mother, dear woman, he's your son. You know, he's thinking about, the fact that his mother has already lost her husband. And now she's losing her son, Jesus Christ. And he's saying, listen, you have a new son who's going who's gonna to be there for you. And he told John, John, here is your mother. He was trying to encourage them to have a bond with each other. He used his dying breaths in order to bring other people together. Not to talk about his pain, not to talk about his hurt, but to build connections of love between people. He was thinking about both of them, that John would need someone to care for and that his mother would need someone to care for her in her moments of pain and anguish. And that both of them could encourage one another. Love is in the details. And, and you know, when we are numb or hurting, we're not paying attention to details. We come home from work, we're exhausted, right? And we're just like, oh, and, and we just want to forget. And we're not paying attention to how our children are or how our spouse is. We go to church again, and maybe it's been a tough week, and we're not thinking about how can I give and how is everybody and what is the big deal in their life that they're facing? And yet, 
when we make that decision to focus on the details, to think about what, what matters, and this really starts in our prayer life. When we pray for other people every day, God will remind us of the details that are important. But Jesus was someone, even on the cross, who was thinking <coughs> about the details of the people he was close to. He wasn't thinking about himself. He was thinking about them and about their details. And so even tonight, as we, as we think about the cross and as we think about our life, think about the people that we know that we should love, those in the church, maybe those at our work, certainly those we live with, our families. And think about those details that are important, the big things and the little things that matter to them. And when we think about those things that really matter to those we love and we are attentive to those things, it, it builds those deep connections. And if we're tired and numb, you still can make a conscious decision. You know what? Maybe I've not been paying attention to the details, but I need to pay attention. You know, the biggest complaint sometimes of, of uh, uh, you know, a, a wife or whatever is she'll get her hair done and the husband doesn't even notice, right? I'm sure I've done that. Not I'm sure, I know I've done that. So anyway, the point is love is in the details, number one. Number two, love is honest. Next verse, you know, Jesus is hanging on the cross after taking care of his mother and his um, disciple, John. The Bible says not later, knowing that now all was completed so that the scripture will be fulfilled, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge and, uh, on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and they lifted it to Jesus' lips. So we see here, second thing about love, love is honest. Now, I'm not saying love has no filter. Sometimes honesty is not the best policy. Like, you know, there's, there's a nice principle I heard that, you know, if you're looking at someone and you see something in their appearance that's wrong, you shouldn't point it out unless it can be fixed within a few seconds. So, for example, if you see someone has maybe some dust on their shoulder, you can, or, or maybe it's dandruff, like happens to me, and you help them brush it off, that's fine because they can fix it. But if you look at someone and they have a blemish on their face and you go, oh, what happened to your cheek? They can't fix it. That's not sensitive, to be honest, asking that question, what happened to your cheek? That's hurtful because it reminds them of something that's wrong with them, okay? But what I'm talking about when I say that love is honest is Jesus was honest about who he was and how he was, and this drew people close to him. You know, remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. I mean, here's the son of God, and he's not being tough. He's being vulnerable. He's saying, man, I'm just overwhelmed. I don't know if I can handle this. You see here as he's suffering on the cross, he, he says, I'm thirsty. I need a drink. This, of course, is a scriptural reference to Psalm 69, 21, a man who had been mocked. It's a reminder that Jesus chose a path of suffering. And of course, when we love, we're willing to suffer for others. We're willing to deny ourselves. We're willing to take up pain so others may be happy, okay? But when we love, we're willing to be honest. And honesty is really, it's hard, and yet it's so powerful. It's powerful at work. You know, one of the things I've learned, perhaps one of the greatest things you can do at work is just be that person who is honest. Be that person who goes, you know, yeah, that was my mistake. And when something dumb happens, you know, like who, who did that? And that was my idea. <laughs> okay. Owning the bad ideas that people are questioning, like whose idea was that? Oh, that was mine. Yeah, that was my mistake. Not being silent when you can own something. Okay. But being honest at work, it'll, it'll change people's lives if you're honest. Honestly praising, honest about your weakness, not honest about their weaknesses. That's a time when it's better to be silent rather than, than pull others down. But I'm talking about being honest about who we are, how we feel. And, and so often for us as men, this is difficult because we don't even know what we feel. <laughs> okay. You know, um, we don't know when we're down. 
we, we, you know, something's bothering us. We, we don't always know, but being honest about, yeah, this, this is, this is how I am right now. I need you. I missed you. I'm thirsty. How are you doing? You know, a, a lot of times we ask each other, how are you? We don't really mean the question, but really asking questions, hey, how are you? And then answering it. Yeah. I th and thinking about it before you answer. Like Mo is so good at this. He, he, he'll ask, how are you? And he actually wants to know. Okay. So when we love, we're honest. Jesus was honest. He was self-aware. He, he let his disciples into his life. He said, come and see who I am. Come and see where I live. And even as he was dying on the cross, Jesus was honest, showing his true self. And we're afraid of showing our true self. A lot of the times we learn this even as children. When you show your true self, when you're honest, people will make fun of you. They'll bully you. They'll mock you. And bullying is very, very common because people feel good when they pull others down. Okay. I mean, you, you think about the internet. The internet is full of all kinds of stuff, a lot of garbage. But one of the things the internet's full of is stories about bad things, bad things that celebrities have done, bad things that have happened to people. And we, we read these things, we feel a little bit better about our life because we see something bad in someone else's life. And so the internet thrives on this kind of negativity. And yet, instead of thriving on the pain of others, God wants us to be honest. And this draws others to us when we are honest, when we are open. But it's hard to do that because we've been bullied, we've been hurt as children, and we, we learn to hide. We learn not to show our true self because if we show our true self, people might reject it or make fun of us. And so we, we try really hard to put a face on, to put a mask on. Maybe we wear, wear makeup. And I'm not saying makeup is bad, but we're afraid if people see what I really look like, they won't like me. We're, we're afraid about how we physically look. We're afraid about saying the wrong thing and doing the wrong thing because people might reject us. And this goes back often to things that happened to us many, many years ago when we were kids or parents or at school. And yet, if we can learn in the church to be honest and to be accepting of one another, when someone is honest, not to push, push them away. You know, if someone has the courage to confess their sins or weakness, that's a great thing, not a bad thing. But we should not judge them, even if we've not committed their, the sin that they've committed. We should appreciate it. And Jesus was a man who was truly honest. And it's one of the reasons children love to be around him. It's one of the reasons the disciples felt comfortable around him. And it worked. If you're the honest person, people will love working with you because they know you are, you're, that what they see is what they get. Okay? That, that honesty. Amen? So love is honest. Then, finally, third thing we see, all in John chapter 19. After they, Jesus was thirsty and they soaked the wine vinegar and, and the sponge, then the Bible says when Jesus had received the drink, he said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. We know also in Luke 23, verse 46, Jesus the Bible says, as his life was ending, looked up to God right after he said, Father, forgive them. And the Bible says that, that with a loud voice, he said, into your hands, I commit my spirit. So he said this, it is finished. And into your hands, I commit his, my spirit. These last two sayings, he said this as he was dying. But the point is that love finishes what it starts. You know, if you look back on your life, one of the things we have the deepest regrets about, I think, at least for me, are relationships that I started and didn't finish. You know, people I was friends with and I didn't really stay friends with them. And I feel bad about that. Love finishes what it starts. This is true with romance. You know, I think sometimes we as brothers are afraid to commit. We're afraid because we want the perfect woman. And yet, I believe God can make any person that we care about into the right spouse for us. But it's all about us 
committing and making that decision. I am going to care about this person and I am going to finish what I started. And Jesus finished what he started. He set out to be a savior for the world. And he knew that this would mean sacrificing himself. And he was willing to go all the way to finish what he started. And when someone really cares about you, they finish what they start. They don't just show a little bit of interest. They show all the interest and they go, they, they go to the end. You, and you know that's important at work. I mean, if you have a colleague who starts things and doesn't finish it, it's maddening, right? They say, oh, yeah, I'll do this project. They, they, they never get it done. Obviously, in school, if we start things and don't finish them, we're not going to get good grades. Jesus finished what he started, and he gave up his spirit to God, okay? Even though he was separated from God, he gave God his spirit at the end. And it's a lot of the time it's hard for us to finish what we start because when we fi are finishing it, we think this isn't good enough. I didn't do it perfectly. I want to redo it. I want to do it perfectly. And we're not happy with imperfection. And yet God made us and we are absolutely imperfect, aren't we? Each of us is imperfect. And yet each of us is perfect. But God finished what he started. You know, it's amazing what happens in the womb where the DNA of, of a man through the sperm goes into the woman's egg and it mixed together. And there's this little map of what a human being will be like. And it's one single cell. That's how we all started. And that single cell divides into two. And then there's two cells. And then it divides again. And then there are dozens and hundreds of cells. And these cells at first don't even know what they're doing. And yet the map of the DNA that God designed tells different cell, you're going to become a muscle. You're going to become bone. You're going to become a spine. You're going to become an eye. And somehow the cells know what to become, okay? And they follow a roadmap and these cells grow. And it's an amazing thing that these cells become a child. And when a child is not finished, either because of abortion, which is a man-made thing, or, or because of an accident of nature, it's a tremendous tragedy that the, what, what God started was not finished, right? But God finishes what he started. He made us into these amazing, amazing creatures with life inside of us from a single cell. And here we are, and we don't have batteries, okay? And we came out of our mother's womb, and this little cell that started as nothing after nine months as a human, and we, if we're lucky, might live 50, 60 70, even 80 years. Think about something that's even five or seven years old, what a phone is like after five to seven years, or what a car is like after 15 or 20. And yet we as humans live 60, 70, 80 years, constantly being replenished. You know, God starts what he finishes. What a beautiful thing that he made us, okay? But love is about that. It's the commitment to start what we finish. You know, I made a decision to become a Christian. I did not know what, where my life as a Christian would take me, what, where I would end up, what I would do. It definitely has not turned out the way I thought. I'm not even sure I knew what I thought, but my life has gone in all kinds of different directions I wouldn't have expected. But I know one thing is that I made a decision. I'm going to be a Christian and I'm not going to quit. And, and you know how hard it is when, when people come to Christ and then for whatever reason, they don't finish what they started. Love finishes what it started. And for, for those who we know, who there are many in the UAE, in the Gulf, who, who started the journey and, and something derailed them. One of the great things we can do is to encourage them, you can still finish what you started. And it wasn't a bad thing that you started on this journey. You know, many mistakes we make in life, but the decision to follow the greatest man who ever lived, the greatest person who ever lived, the decision to base my life on the scriptures, the decision to try and live a life of principle instead of a life of greed or selfishness. I, I don't look back and go, oh, that was a mistake. And you go, oh, sometimes people think, oh, I joined this church, but the church isn't perfect. Church has all kinds of problems. Of course, the church has problems. 
Jesus didn't come to build a perfect church. He came to save us. And we are part of the church. And sometimes the church will be great. And sometimes the church isn't so great. But it doesn't matter. Love finishes what it starts. So three simple points tonight. Things that we all already know. And you know, like everything, what's great about the Bible. And one of the reasons we love the Bible is you read it and you, you go, I already knew that was true. Like, I've always known this. Love is in the details. Love cares about the little things, the bow in the little girl's hair, the hunger, the mosquito, the picking the lice. You know, one of the things I loved in India was seeing the poor where they would sit and they would patiently pick the lice out of each other's hair. And I remember thinking so much love and compassion to care enough for someone to take the bugs out of their hair. But, but that's, that's someone who loves you does that kind of stuff, right? Jesus cared about the big things in people's lives and the little things. And as he was dying on the cross, he was caring about his disciple who was close enough to, to see him, John. He was caring about his mother. Love's all about the details. And if we've been numb and we haven't been caring about the details, now's a good time to just make that decision. I'm going to try and pay more attention. Secondly, love's honest. It's so refreshing and encouraging when people are honest. And I love that about the church. I love that I can be honest. I love that people in the church are honest and that, that we are our real selves. And I feel, I feel really at home in the church. At work, I feel like I've got to be somebody. You know, I've got I've to be, I can't be fully me. Now, I try to be me because I think it's the right thing to do. But it's, you know, it's hard to be ourselves at work because we know we'll be judged. And yet God wants us to be honest. And I think this is one of the ways we win people to Christ is when we're honest. And it, and it does make us more effective workers. Jesus said, I'm thirsty. Finally, love finishes what it starts. Jesus said, it is finished. He said, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Jesus, to the very end, stayed steadfast. You know, this week, if you want to do a memory verse, John 19, 26 and 27, where Jesus is caring for John and his mother, and, you know, in terms of homework, what a chance to spend some special time with our family and to tell them personally how much they mean to us, okay? And you may have messed up with your family in recent days, okay? You may have been impatient. I know I was impatient with Priscilla the other day when she bunked school, okay? But what a special opportunity to be able to encourage them and tell them how much you care for them. Amen. So that's our little lesson for tonight. I'm going to um, uh, go ahead and paste it and I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm happy for us to have discussion. And I think our discussions here have frankly been amazing and very um, encouraging, at least to me. So there you go. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for patiently listening. Uh, I, as always, I love the details uh, that you always give in your lessons, um, the little details that you bring about and highlight. Uh, I think for me, uh, the first point was very pertinent because I've, I, when I'm exhausted and stressed, I really, don't, I really don't see many details around me. I'd rather have others see the details in me uh, and I'd rather have them look at the details that I'm going through <laughs> rather than looking at the details of what others are going through. So thank you for sharing that. That was humbling. I think my, my family could all give a resounding yes to that point. <laughs> so I think, thank you for bringing that up. And definitely it's sinful in that area, need to grow. And the cross is always a humbling place. Thank you so much for what you have shared today, Mark. Um, I'm going to get straight away into the questions. Uh, already received uh, uh, a couple of them. One I've received just now is uh, when you talk about being honest, I think that probably has made us all think, you know, uh, that at, at one point you also said that honesty is not always the best policy uh, in certain circumstances, yes. And one of them has asked, uh, how far can we be honest about ourselves? And uh, what if being honest uh, causes others to react uh, negatively? So in that case, what do we do? These are great questions. And Jesus, it says, spoke the truth to them as much as they could understand. So I think Jesus was honest. But he also knew 
there are limits to what people can take. And God himself, thinking about how God was with us, God did not immediately give us the truth that I'm going to give you a Messiah who dies on a cross. God started with a simple, a simpler message, which was the law. Like, here's a bunch of rules. You need to follow these rules and you will live. Talk about them on the road. You know, he taught them to love the word of God. But the word of God in the Old Testament was a set of rules. It wasn't the full truth. God did not reveal the full truth of Jesus until we were ready for it. So there's definitely an aspect to being open and honest that respects the listener, okay? And, and I think we know this is intuitively true. You know, like suppose someone has gained a lot of weight. Women gain weight when they're pregnant and they feel insecure about it, but it's a natural thing that happens to our body. But it's not a very encouraging thing. If, if a woman has gained weight in pregnancy, you go, oh, wow, you've really gained a lot of weight. Whoa, you know, that's really honest, like that intelligent observation. Or at church, sometimes I've been to church and someone's walked up to me and go, bro, you look so exhausted, bro. Or, or at work, you know, where, where someone comes up and goes, oh, you look sleepy, like I shared about last, last time. You know, that kind of honesty, even though it's true, it's not focused on what's positive. And so when we're being honest, one question we can ask is, is my honesty bringing out something positive in someone else or is it bringing out something negative? And if it's bringing out something negative about someone else, maybe that's something where I, 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 I best should not mention that unless it's helpful. Because it says in Ephesians 4.29, only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. So is this something that they need? But when I'm talking about honesty of Jesus, Jesus was honest about himself in a way that he let people into his life so that they knew him. And this is where being self-aware and, and you know, having our quiet times and it, it, being honest about where we're at. But again, not necessarily, oh, I'm really angry at you. I just want to be honest. Mark said to be honest. I just feel really angry. I just need to be honest. You know, that's not positive again. So but, but an honesty that recognizes our own weakness, that shares our weakness, that shares how we are, that is vulnerable and, and willing to ask for help, that kind of honesty draws us together. So it's a, it's a very good question, but, but I think we know when we're being vulnerable and we're letting people in and we're not hiding. Oh, thank you. That, those are some very valid uh, comments there, Mark. Thank you. Uh, would there, how, how do we help, someone asked here, how do we help people to be honest with them? You know, in the sense that, okay, if, if I'm hurt, to, to be able to say I'm hurt or to say, you know, that offended me or whatever. In order to have long-term relationships, obviously you need to have honest relationships. But how can we uh, keep those relationships honest at the same time, be able to express what we honestly are feeling in order to maintain and keep long-term relationships? Though that's another great question. I, I think if we know if we know that we've messed up and we've hurt someone, without grilling them with a hundred questions, opening the door, like you know, I'm certain I've been insensitive to you and I don't fully even understand the ways I've messed up. But I want to open the door for you to share if that's something you want to do. You know, that, that doesn't put it on them. Like, I know you're a super hypersensitive person and you get e or easily hurt. So I can tell you're hurt right now. That's a very bad way to say it. Okay. But hey, I know I'm a jerk. And I think I've, I've I, I'm like, I know I've done some things even re recently that were harsh or that, that didn't help you. I'm sorry. I would, I would love to understand better how, you know, if you want to talk about it, but I don't want to force you, you know, making it a very much a, an environment where someone else is able to share and where they feel like I'm not going to be punished. Because one of the things we do, and we do this in our marriages, right, is when our spouse starts to be vulnerable, we react and snap at them. And this is the best way to shut down communication is when our spouse is honest, maybe vulnerable, we react and we 
make excuses, we interrupt them, we get angry, and that they're going to learn, well, that's not a good idea. You know, this person just reacts when I'm honest, so I'm just going to be quiet and drink or, <laughs> or say nothing, okay? So avoiding reaction is another important key with uh, promoting honesty. Asking questions and not judging the answer. There's no, you know, like, like someone may have, someone's first reaction to something may be very sinful, and then they may react to their reaction and go, that was really wrong. I'm sorry about that. But it's important to let them work through it. So anyway, these are, these are just some thoughts. I think avoiding the error of Job's friends is important. Job's friends at the beginning did the right thing where they listened. To, they just sat with him and felt his pain. Once they started trying to fix him and talking, that's when they messed up and God had to rebuke them later because they were trying to fix him. They did better when they just sat with him because they saw how great his suffering was. So empathizing is a lot better often than trying to fix people. Thanks a lot, Mark. Can I just add one more thing to that? Since you're we're already in that thought of thought trail, somebody has asked whether what's is there a difference then between honesty and 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 being truthful? Because sometimes you hear that statement, right? I was I was just speaking the truth. You know, you want me to be honest, right? Here's the truth. <laughs> and you just give it off. Um, but uh, is there a difference between those two? Well, Jesus was full of grace and truth. The truth is not always helpful. And even if someone knows the truth, often it's better to let them say the truth than for you to say the truth to them. Think about this for a minute. We know sometimes that we've messed up. You know, I find it much easier for myself to say what I did wrong in London as a leader than for someone else to, to recite to me my wrongs, even if they say the exact same thing I would say. You know, for me to hear them judge me and say, yeah, Mark, you did this and you did that. Just hearing them judge me hurts. But if I say I did this and I did that, that same truth coming out of my mouth is easier for me to take. I think we have to be very careful about being the judge and truth giver to others about their weakness. I think principles, teaching principles are valuable, but challenging others, we have to ask, is this helpful? Now, there are times when it is helpful, when the most loving thing we can do is to be honest with someone and tell them what they need to hear. But it's important that they're receptive. You know, like my, my son, I love my son with all my heart. My son right now is not very happy, to be honest. But he needs our, my empathy more than he needs my judgment. I mean, I can easily tell him, well, you know, if you were just following Jesus, you'd be happy. I mean, that's not going to help him. Okay. Now, do I think that? I honestly do think that if, that if he was with Christ, he would be able to cope better with the things that trouble him. But I know that telling him he's not ready for that truth right now, but there are other truths that he might be ready for, like considering different job opportunities or, or considering ways to take care of his health. You know, there, there are, there is truth he's ready to take, but we've got to really think when we tell the truth, are they ready for this? It's the same with teaching mathematics. I mean, if you try to teach a first grade or long division, all you're going to do is produce tears. You've got to first teach them addition, okay? And then you teach multiplication. You teach the times table. And long division is very hard to understand unless you have a good grasp of the times table. But, but it's the truth. I taught them long division. They just couldn't take it. They weren't ready for it. They need to be brought to the point of long division. And, and I know because I've made my kids cry trying to teach them long division. <laughs> you know, they, they need to first be understand how to add, how to carry, how to subtract, how to multiply small numbers, all of those things. And then they can do long division. So, you know, and, and that's a mathematical truth. How much more spiritual truth? Oh, boy. 
<laughs> I remember being taught like that. <laughs> oh man. Maths, mathematics definitely was not my forte and still is not. <laughs> uh, you know, Mark, um, you know, especially in, let, let's say in marriage, we find sometimes one partner or maybe sometimes both the partners, you know, you know sort of keep going at the other, pa- other partner's weakness. Um, probably to the point of even bullying in some ways, constantly picking, constantly sort of, you know, taking on the other person. Um, in, probably in the pretext of I'm speaking the truth, you know. Um, how, what would you advise in that sort of a dynamic? That's a good question. I've been married a long time. Um, I don't think pointing out the obvious about your spouse always helps them. You know, they may be well aware of what's wrong with themselves. You telling them something they already know may not be helpful. What can be helpful is trying to figure out the root. You know, what is it that is really bothering them? So judging simply the behavior and telling them your behavior is wrong, as opposed to trying to understand what is going on with them, that's a more helpful strategy. And, and, you know, we, we can all look back on difficult times in our own spiritual life and simply telling someone, you know, you're not giving or you're this or you're that, that might be true, okay? Like, but if we don't dig deep and try to understand, you know, how can I be, how can I encourage you or what is it that you'd like to do with me? You know, let's say you have a spouse that is retreating into watching streaming videos all the time and doesn't want to spend the time with the family. There's a reason for that. It's not, you know, like they're sad about something or they're, you know, interactions with the family are difficult for them or they feel like they're no good at it or it's too painful or whatever. And so trying to dig deeper than saying, you're always watching your stupid streaming series or you're always playing the stupid video game. Well, that may be true, but maybe there's a reason for for it that is deeper, like they feel defective. And and when you're the thing about computers or pets, neither computers nor pets judge us. Okay, a computer video game is not mean to us. I mean, there may be an evil villain, but the villain is behaves the same. You know what I mean? And we're trying to kill the villain. A pet is the same way. A pet unconditionally loves us. And so people will, will, will have very good relationships with computers or pets. And I'm not saying this is a bad thing, but there's a reason for that is that, that there's a pain that we feel when we interact with humans who hurt us, okay? And a lot of times there's unresolved pain. And so simply judging someone's behavior, saying you're always watching Netflix or you're always you know, playing a video game or you, you, know, you don't pay, you come home from work and you don't give to the family, that's all true. But the, 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 the goal of communication should not be simply, I was honest, but rather, how can communication get us to more righteousness? And so figuring out what, what amount of communication is helpful and what amount is not. So, so really thinking about that, and we know this from ourselves, because you know when I have people at work who overlook my offenses, and I know they've overlooked my offense. I'm appreciative. I think that, that was pretty cool. And when someone points out my offense, I'm also like, yeah, that was true. But I, it doesn't want me to make me want to hang out with them, right? Now, sometimes when they point it out in a very sensitive and thoughtful way, it is helpful. But you have to really think, is this helpful? You know, is this challenging thing I'm saying helpful? Or is it just going to hurt this person? And, and it's, you really got to think about the person when you're talking and not just blurt it out because you feel good. So anyway, I don't know if that's helpful, but that's something to wrestle with. I know as a, as a leader in, in a younger leader in the church, I felt like I have to speak the truth. And I spoke a lot of truth that I think was more truth than was necessary. 
and not enough grace and sensitivity. And now I try to err more on the side of, is this really a necessary truth or shall I give God more time to work? So, you know, I've changed my approach because I, I recognize that lots of truth and truth may just be my opinion. It may not even be true. Is not always. Thank you. Thank you so much for that perspective. I, I think I read somewhere once in a book when I said it's like cutting someone's nose and then asking them to smell the rose. <laughs> Thank you so much for bringing that out, Mark. Uh, the other thing was about loving the details that you mentioned. Uh, sometimes would, would details vary between people? Like, for example, what matters a lot to me doesn't matter a lot to someone else. So it's always perspective, right? So where the details are bigger or smaller. So if let's say if someone feels that their little detail was neglected or ignored, or can they be honest about it? And, and would that be needy to actually talk about it? You know, I think that's a great, a great question. I think we all have, there's the book about love languages, right? And so for some people, it really matters to them. Like, like I know for me, one of the ways I know someone's my friend is they're willing to listen to my stupid stories, you know, and I go into great detail, much more detail than is necessary about the things that happened to me. And if someone is willing to care about that stuff and listen to it and not be bored out of their mind or annoyed, then I, I would say, oh, that person's my friend. And so like when I would go to church and if people ask me, how is your work? And they are actually interested. That for me is important to me. But I recognize that for someone else, that may not be how that love is expressed. You know, for someone else, they may just want to chill and listen to music and peacefully sit. And they will, you know, and for them, that's what love is, right? And it's not that my way of, of love, my way of connection is to really understand what someone's life is like. I feel like I'm loving them, you know, so I'll ask questions about their life. Other people may not appreciate all my stupid questions. But for me, understanding what their day is like and what is it like for their work and what is their home like and knowing their life and understanding it for me is a way to connect. But for other people, it may not be that. They just want to be together. They just want to appreciate one another or be silent or enjoy one another's company without, you know what I mean? And so, or do something fun. So, so your question is well-spoken and I think making sure others understand, you know, it really helps me when you do this, or I love when you do that, or I love when I, you know, reinforcing the good behaviors that we appreciate and, and, uh, you know, gently going, you know, that's not my favorite thing to do, ah, <laughs> you know, like making a joke and hopefully they'll get the point that, you know, bah, you know, not my favorite moment, but thank you, <laughs> you know, um, there are ways without getting emotional and angry to kind of give signals to people like, ah, you know, eh, yep, yep, I don't like that about me either. Thank you. Can we talk about something else? You know, so. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, you know, in terms of being honest, again, uh, some questions on that. Um, obviously, you mentioned uh, you know, honesty is not always the best policy. Okay. Um, when is it justifiable not to be, you know, really honest? Or let's say if someone brings up something you know, which is long gone, you know, hurts or something which is long gone, is it uh, justifiable to bring it up at a much later time? So how can we balance that? Well, that, that's a good question. And I've, you know, I've been, I've definitely been the recipient of that. I'm sure I've done it as well. But if someone brings up a long gone hurt, it may be that they felt threatened and in a position of authority where they couldn't bring it up. So, you know, it could take them years because they always felt like they, they, if they bring it up, they could get in trouble or something bad could happen. And so they, you know, they'll endure it for a long time, um, maybe longer than they should. So we have to understand if someone brings up a long lost hurt, that there was probably a reason that they felt for a long time they couldn't bring it up. Maybe because of our lack of a vulnerability or our aggressive behavior or, or something about us made people afraid. 
And I've certainly, as a leader, made people feel or people who didn't know me would feel, oh, there's no way I could tell him that, you know, like Mark will never listen, you know, and maybe they were right. So, so being aware of the fact that if it takes someone a long time to say something, that may have something to do with us. That's, I think, one point. I think that, that we have to think carefully before we bring up a long lost hurt, because most of the time they won't even remember, you know, and the chance of them responding well is not going to be super good. Now, you know, on the other end, if someone brings something up, really try to understand and be genuinely sorry about what, what happened, because if, they, if they've taken the time and effort to bring it up, try to be humble. But on the other end, you know, I don't want to spend my life trying to remember all the wrongs people did me. That's going to bring darkness into my heart. I'd rather think about the good and there's plenty of good things and that fills my heart with light and makes me want to draw light out of me, which of course is in the scriptures that if your body's full of light, you'll bring good things out of the good stored up within you. But if you've got all this negativity stored up within you, negativity will come out. So, so, you know, um, but, but where the test is always, what do people need? And if, Sometimes people need a hard talk. You know, for example, let's say someone's super lazy and keeps losing their job because they're always late. What does that person need from his friend? They need to talk about, hey, you know, I know you think you always lose your job because your bosses are mean, but it may have something to do with your discipline. And, you know, I've seen this in your life and I'm not trying to be down on you, but I want you to be successful You've got to do better with being on time. It's selfish for you to be late. And you often are late. And you know, I love you, but you're almost always late. Like there are people who are always late, okay? Like if we have a meeting, they're always the ones who come late to dinner, always. It's always the same people. And it's selfishness. Now, again, if they're very successful, you think, okay, well, that's them. And you may not bring it up. But if they're losing their job, you know, and they're being hurt by life, then maybe you have to have a talk and go, you know, I have something that might help you, but it's going to be hard for you to hear. Are you ready to hear it? And they may go, I don't know, bro. You always bring things up. Say, I'm so sorry about that. Tell me about how I do that. And then you don't even bring it up. You, you, you turn it about you. But if they're open and they recognize it, then you, you, you go for the truth. Like with my son, I want to help my son to have a happier life. I'm going to try and have a conversation with him when I'm with him in July one-on-one, -on -one, not by phone, and, and, and talk to him about his life and, and point out some ways he could change. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probe. I'm not going to just jive in there and start being negative. I'm going to ask him how he is, and I'm going to try and find, is he open to going in a different direction? You know, But, but it's going to be based on what he needs, not on what I need. Thank you, Mark. Thanks so much for sharing that. I think we'll have time for one last question. A couple of more, I just keep one more. Um, talking about all this, you know, hurts and um, pain and traumas and things like that. And it is how, how, how advisable, how, or how important it is, you know, to have people in our lives with whom we can be vulnerable with, especially with these painful experiences. Um, you think it's, it's healthy and important to have people with whom we can be vulnerable and deal with these experiences? Absolutely. And we need to be careful if people are being vulnerable with us that we don't get too wounded, because sometimes we will take on their wounds and we will get, if we're very empathetic, I've known some very empathetic brothers who've been destroyed by, they, they listened to too much negativity and they themselves plunged into darkness, you know, because it was too much for them to bear. So, but I do think absolutely we need people who, who can hear us out and, you know, who can say, okay, you've shared enough, snap out of it, man. I mean, what you're saying is true, but this is getting negative, you know? So, but I, but I think we need people we, we can be honest with and be ourselves and who will endure our stupid honesty, you know, and still love us. Um, so yes, we need that. We, we just have to be careful about getting too negative. Because honesty, the world is full of horrible things. 
And if we just dwell on what's horrible, like it lets, if we start talking about Ukraine and, and the stuff that's going on there, I mean, I'm going to want to go and take a gun and go start killing people, right? You know, because I, I get very, very, very angry when I think about what's happening in Ukraine. And I feel like going over there and fighting, okay? But that's probably not righteous on my part. I'm not saying the Ukrainians are defending their homeland are unrighteous. That's a different issue. But for me, to do that is not healthy, but sometimes that's what happens when we get too sucked into to stuff, you know, that is not our fight. So anyway, just, just worth thinking about. I don't, and again, I don't think that everything I say is necessarily right or true. These are just ideas that you have to wrestle with and say, is this scriptural and is it right? But th there are things that are worth considering at least. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much for giving us a lot of things to think about. Um, some really great advice perspective i think definitely from your own experiences thanks for teaching us mark uh, from that and your humility to accept uh, your own mistakes uh, and I, I really appreciate that really do and known you known you for so many years being in your uh, in your home eating your food <laughs> uh, yeah you shouldn't be covering your face mark i should be <laughs> okay <laughs> so many memories thank you for being patient with me in those years and uh, i learned a lot. I have still incredible memories uh, from those days. Thank you so much for that. Um, and thank you, UAE. Thank you for Jacob, Bina, all the rest, just uh, organizing this. And I'm glad that we can all sit and be at the foot of the cross. It's the best place to be in. You know, no matter how many times you've heard something about the cross, it always speaks volumes again and again. So let's just bow our heads, uh, say big thanks to God, say a prayer. Heavenly Father, you're truly uh, amazing. Uh, the way you look at our lives, the way you see us, the, the details of our lives you look into, how you even count our hairs. Um, it's amazing. Thank you for loving us with such honesty, being so interested in our lives and genuinely interested. And I pray that teach me that as well. And God be able to uh, love honestly and uh, be able to speak truth in love and patience and know when not to speak it, Father, and really be able to share lovingly and kindly the way you would. And Father, all these things are so much to learn, God. Life is all about learning and just constantly learning and being nudged by your spirit in that direction, constantly being nudged by your word, reminded, sometimes knocked on the head to wake up. Thank you so much for doing that patiently over the years for not giving up on us, for loving us sinful people, uh, sinful me, God, and for so many years for tolerating all my nonsense. Thank you for overlooking so many of my blunders. Thank you so much for that, God. Thank you for the cross. It's always a humbling place. Thank you, God, for your life that has impacted us and continues to impact us. Thank you for Mark, his life, his uh, example, and all the things he's able to teach us from his life. And thank you so much that we can learn till we go to the grave. So grateful for the fact that we can be your followers. We love you very much, Father. Thank you. Thank you for being gracious upon us. In your son's most holy and precious and lovely name, we pray. Amen.